Hello friends, I'm Chris Rule. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando, an author, adventurer and extreme endurance athlete. In this series of videos, I'm telling you what life in the Royal Marines is really like. Not the stuff that they tell you in the recruiting office. So if you thought Royal Marines was like this, then you're probably in for a bit of a shock. So please subscribe and support the channel. And remember, you get one life. If you live it right, one is enough. Hello friends, I hope this finds you well. Welcome to another edition of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. I'm your host, Chris Thrall, though I'm, I'm sure most of you know that by now. And today, it's just me. So I thought I'd tell you the story of when the Royal Marines met the US Marines. Now, this took place, well, I mean, you know, the British Royal Marines and the, U the United States Marines have met, I'm sure, on a number of occasions, but obviously I'm going to talk about my own experience. It was when I was on the aircraft carrier HMS Invincible. As some of, some of you will already know, I served as part of a 12-man high security detachment protecting the top secret weapons on board. So there were anywhere up to, well, over 2,000 ship's crew and air crew when we were at sea. And there were just 12 of us Marines walking around the ship, carrying nine millimeter pistols. And as I say, our job was to protect things I'm probably not supposed to speak about. Um, and this was primarily when we were alongside, so when the ship was in port, to make sure nobody boarded us illegally. Got to travel to some really nice places on, on HMS Invincible, and I thoroughly enjoyed being at sea. It's one of the, one of the things I think I enjoy the most. And we went on what's known as a med trip, if you if you're European or if you're British, you know I'm referring to the Mediterranean, right? And we visited, well, first stop was Gibraltar. Then it was um, Istanbul or Turkey. We, we visited a lot of places, Egypt. A lot of us got off the ship and we got a bus to Cairo and we had a great three days in Cairo, seeing the pyramids and everything. Um, but the most, one of the most memorable parts of that tr trip was stopping in Sicily. Sicily being the home to the... Na, 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 na. I don't know if that's the right music, but the Italian mafia, of course. La Cosa Nostra. And when you're in... When you're on Sicily, which is an island in the Mediterranean off Italy, you see lots of uh, sneaky looking men carrying violin cases. In fact, every single guy there has a violin case. And you kind of wonder why. Anyway, there we were. Our ship was in, in the port. And my friend Steve, who we called Ogalog, and we called him Ogalog because when he had his hair cut and he had a bit spiky on top, he looked like a turkey. So we used, every time he had his hair cut, the other 11 of us would go, 
Ogle, 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 ogle. <laughs> so I started calling him Ogalog and that, that name stuck. Well, Steve, or if you prefer, Ogalog, said to, I said to him, Steve, what are you doing today? And generally, when ships are alongside, pretty much everybody in the ship's company who's not on duty goes ashore. They find either the nearest bar or they find a famous bar that's um, all the ships that have been for many, many years before. All their ship's companies go, you've got to go to this bar. And that just becomes the place everyone goes. Well, I never really did that. I mean, I wasn't adverse to doing it, but when I was in such foreign locations, such exotic climes, I wanted to make the most of it. I wanted to go sightseeing and seeing all those things that I'd seen on the television growing up. Um, perhaps I'll talk more about that in another podcast, but one time the whole of the ship's company went in one pub. It's in Gibraltar. Is it Penelope's? Can some of my uh, military or Matlow friends remind me? Is it Penelope's, the famous bar in Jib? Well, the whole of the ship's company, when we had a day in Gibraltar, all went in this bar from nine o'clock in the morning when it probably opened. And I think we, put, we all piled out of it about two or three in the morning. But in the earlier part of the day, I visited the famous rock in Gibraltar, I went up and fed the monkeys who are not shy in coming backwards. Those things will, you know, they're not afraid to jump on you if they can get any food. So I saw the fame, or well, went up the famous rock. Um, I then went to visit the petrol station where there was a very famous incident in the 80s. Some of you will remember. It's where an, an SAS team undercover shot dead an active service unit from the Irish Republican Army, so the IRA. The military had got intelligence that this four-man team were in Gibraltar and that they were planning to set a bomb off. So I went to see this petrol station. You could still see the bullet holes in the uh, petrol pumps where this um, ambush had taken place. I think it was four, possibly three um, IRA soldiers were killed. One of them was a woman, I seem to remember. And somebody had got a photo of it and they'd put it in one of the one of the very first men's magazines that was kind of like the lads mag magazine type thingy. Was it called Sky? Again, someone who can remember it. It was one of the first magazines aimed at men growing up basically you know sort of adolescent men and someone and in, they ran an article on this ambush and they put this photo in the magazine and it, it was an eye opener for somebody even who'd been in the forces to see these I don't know if it was three or four SAS men just dressed like I am now or as they would have been in the 80s, faded denim jackets, hat, baseball cap, training shoes, jeans, but all just putting their um, pistols back in their holsters. Um, so, I'm just pausing there because my computer has just come on which means we've got noise. Bear with me. Right, we're back. So this um, magazine had a photograph in, and I, as I say, it was of these. And they were all reholstering their pistols, not browning nine millimeters. Um, it was quite a 
quite an eye-opener. Eye yeah, it was just quite an eye-opener um, to see this SAS unit in, in action, all wearing civilian clothes. So I saw the petrol station, then I got a bus into Spain and I hopped aboard a ferry to Africa and I spent the day, the rest of the day in Morocco, met a really nice Moroccan gentleman who took me out and treated me. We had a, um, it's Islamic country, but you can drink alcohol there. So we had quite a few drinks in a bar that evening and he was bringing, every time you have a, you ordered a drink in Morocco, you got bought a little plate of food, sort of like hors d'oeuvres sort of thing. And uh, one of them was goat's feet, which was, yeah, again, interesting. And so, oh, and the end of that story was I went back to Gibraltar on the ferry, had a little uh, Moroccan lad running alongside me as I was rushing to get the ferry back. He said, Mr. Mr. Hashish, Hashish. And I looked down and he's holding up this nugget of hash that was as big as a lump of coal. <laughs> and uh, I don't even think I, I didn't, I didn't even really smoke back then, but I'd heard that you could eat this stuff. So I said, oh, let's have a look. And he gave me this nugget. And every time he looked away, I was trying, I was trying to take a bite and it was all getting stuck. You know, this, I mean, hashish is, it's almost rock hard, but it was getting stuck in my teeth. And I got on that ferry and I promptly fell, fell asleep. By the time I got back to the jib, everybody was still in this, is it Penelope's nightclub? They hadn't moved all day, and yet I'd done all these things. That's just kind of how my mind works. So going back to Sicily, I said to Steve Ogalog, you know, what are you doing today? He said, Chris, I'm going to go uh, to the American air base. It's a, it's, I think it was a... a a naval air station. It's a place called Siganella. So I said, Steve, do you mind if I tag along? No, not at all. So me, Steve, and a third chap, Pete, got attacked, jumped in a taxi, and we drove across Sicily, which is a beautiful country. It's this rolling, um, almost sort of mountainous landscape but it, a, vo a volcanic landscape and you is it Mount Etna I think is on Sicily Mount Etna's there in the background the the famous volcano and it really does look like something you'd see in the Godfather when they do the scenes of the of the old the old country we arrived at this airbase I'm going to call it I think it was a naval air station right I'll just call it an airbase and they were having an open day or they were having a festival day in the way that Americans and Canadians do really well we have these really big beer festivals and it's everything sort of going off and we kind of everything in the UK is on a much smaller scale and I've got some photos here just to, to remind me of how the story went. Yeah, so Steve and I sat down. We sat down at a bar, an outside bar, a table outside, and we, we got a couple of Budweiser's. And as we were drinking away and taking in all, all these people, uh, this girl came over, and she, or this girl was sat at the table, and she leaned across and said something. And when she heard we had British accents... Or English accents she went oh you guys marines and she turned around and she went guys oi US marines these guys are British marines and they said they can drink you all under the table <laughs> and with that this group of, of, of 10 or 15 US Marines just descended on us and it was all handshakes and how you doing man and wow you're British Marines and I'll take this opportunity to say Americans are just so nice I'm talking generally speaking 
everywhere I've been in the world, I've just met really nice Americans and they have to be among the most generous people on, on the planet. Of course, I'm not talking everybody, right? You know, you get some pretty racist, not so nice rednecks, right? And 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 what what you you can come up with your own examples, but but the ones I've met have been so kind, so um, open, and so wanting to know about your culture or your country. And so these guys came over, and we're all look at my photos here. We're all um, yeah, just getting drunk, basically. Obviously, British Marines meet the U.S. Marines. You're going to get drunk. There was no rivalry or right? there was nothing like you know maybe a bit of friendly banter but there was no um you know there was no nothing untoward you know it was just immediately you realize these are your brothers we might be from across a big pond but they're just your brother there's no like oh you're american marines but we're royal marines it's just it's not like that 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 kind of equate that isn't part of the equation it's your Marines, we're Marines, we're brothers. That's that's it. Just meet like that. It's it's quite an amazing phenomenon. Probably uh, on another day, I could analyse that about how that sends young men off to war, right? But I'm not going to talk about that today. And they took us to their clubhouse. The Marines had a clubhouse. They were explaining them their job to us. They. They were doing a similar job to us, i.e. guard duty and protecting this air base. And they had to go down a bunker. They had to, to, you know, obviously do shift work. And some of them had to go down this bunker. They called it the hole, which was interesting because on ship, we had to go down the hole, which was a series of kind of three decks. You went down three lots of ladders. And you finally got into the deep into the hold of the ship where they um, stored these top secret top secret missiles. But uh, yeah, so they went down there and, and for some reason they called it Club Mal. I don't know. They, they gave me a T-shirt. Americans are so generous. They've given us T-shirts and ball caps and, and memorabilia and you know, knives and all this stuff. And we're there kind of, want a beer? <laughs> it's just British generosity. And uh, they, gave one, they gave me a T-shirt. I had it for years and it said, have a bitch in time at Club Mao. And it had a cocktail glass on it. But, but Club Mao was their nickname for going down this, this hole. And it was interesting, you know, to meet these guys who... They, you know, they, a lot of them were rednecks. Uh, they were hunters. They, they were, you know, what, what gets referred to as home, homeboys, is it? Um, you know, not homeboys as in, you know, like hip hop, but um, it was just interesting to hear their stories. One guy was telling me about how he shot, it was an elk, or I don't know what they call it in America, is it elk or moose? Um, and they chopped this animal's head off after they sort of skinned it and taken the meat. And he was so proud that he'd got his, he'd killed this elk that he wanted to take the antlers. And everyone said, no, oh, you're never, you, you know, you're too young, son. He was obviously young. It was a, a younger time for him. And uh, he's like, no, 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 I will, I'll carry this elk. And he didn't want to lose these antlers. And so he, he put the elk in his pack and he, he kind of yomped out of this, this um, forest. But, but it was interesting. There's a, a, another chap, he had this Rolex on. He's like, yeah, I like my Rolex. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you like my Rolex? And, and we got chatting and he said, it's not real. I said, why didn't you just say it's not, not real? He's like, no. You don't tell these guys that, you know. You got to get power over these guys, and so they all think I wear a real Rolex. It was just, it was something, something really quirk, quirky like that. And uh, one of them brought, you can see in this picture here, brought his 
a cowboy hat out for, for us for us to put on. And then it's like, you know, you're with Americans. And in the morning, we saw them all, some of them all getting ready for duty or for tr some form of training. With their uniform, which is a smart uniform. But if you've seen the Royal Marines Blues photo, uh, I'm, I'm honestly not being biased here. I just don't think anything beats the British Royal Marines uniform. Um, set maybe the traffic wardens. Uh, that's pretty cool. And the other interesting thing is when I when I served back in the eighties and nineties, our Royal Marines was predominantly white British male. In in every troop or maybe even every company, you might have had one black guy, but it wasn't much more than that. Um, and yet, when you're with the Americans, of course, it's a lot of black dudes, it's a lot of Hispanics. And if you've ever seen the film Heartbreak Ridge, if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend you watch it, even if it's just to, to have a bit of a laugh at the USMC's or Clint Eastwood's expense. But it's uh, it was really this airbase on Siganella being around these Marines. It just it reminded me of watching watching that film. So at that point, we invite. Oh no, I didn't tell you. So there we are, all getting drunk with them, and one of them says, "Guys, do you want to see our weapons?" <laughs> so it's eleven o'clock at night. We're all drunk off our heads. And they take us to their armory. The next thing, you hear this. Say, there's some Royal Marines around here. And it's their drill instructor. Or they, no, their gunny. Is it gunny sergeant? Their gunnery sergeant, who they call gunny, right? And gunny comes in and it's just, it's like something out of a, a Hollywood film. He's shouting so loudly. So full of, so full of himself. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's a nice guy, but it's like, are you guys for real? So every, everyone's so loud. And they opened up their armory at 11 o'clock at night. And we're going inside this, what, what is essentially a safe, a vault that's locked. And, and they've led us in there and they got all their weapons out. So we're there looking at Glocks and Uzi 9mm and, you know, Rem Remington pistols, all this kind of thing. I I I don't remember the 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 you know I don't remember the weaponry if I'm really honest. Just just that they got all these pistols out and all these automatic weapons, and we're <laughs> drunk off our heads. Yeah, look at this one. Yeah, wow, wow. Um, and it was funny. There's like, do you want a drink? In the morning, we woke up. We all woke up on the floor of their room. Like, do you want, are you thirsty? And of course we're all thirsty. We're all really hung over. Like, right, you need a Jew, man. You need a Jew. Oh. So I think he's going to go and get some Jewish guy. No, he comes with this bottle and it's got Mountain Dew written on it. And you've got to remember, this is like a, a while back. So we didn't have such things in the UK back then. It's like, you've got to drink this one, man. You've got to drink this. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. <laughs> drinking Mountain Dew for the first time. I'm probably the last. Then the guy, we said, guys, let, let us reciprocate. You come to our ship, come to the aircraft carrier, spend the day. So they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll get higher cars, we'll get higher cars. So we went down and uh, their bases are probably so big you could hire the cars on the base. I might be wrong there. I can't remember how we hired them. But... What I did remember is we hired about three cars, it may have been four, and these guys were used to driving automatic, not what they call stick shift, right? <laughs> and their guys driving had never driven uh, stick shift cars before. 
I don't even know what we call them in the UK because most people just drive, you know, don't drive automatics, but let's just call it stick shift, you know what I mean. And they didn't understand the clutch. So every single time, every single time they pulled away, it was foot to the floor on the accelerator and just let, let the foot straight off the clutch and the car was doing this massive, massive wheel spin. And we drove through the center of, um, oh God, I'm showing my, my, it's not my ignorance, it's my bad memory. The capital of Sicily. Come on, who's gonna put that in the comments? Uh, we drove through the centre of the capital of Sicily with these guys just... And if you've ever seen Italian traffic, it's it's bumper to bumper. I mean, it's literally bumper to bumper. And these guys were insane. Um, but you can see that. I'll show you this photo here. This is me and one of the dudes. We're driving down the highway and we're holding hands. Just good job a motorbike didn't decide to come down down the middle of us, huh? And so uh, yeah, we're in the uh, in the jam packed city, and these guys are mental. They're not just doing the wheel spins all the time, but they're hammering through this traffic. And they were telling us a lot about their relationship with the Italians, and it wasn't very good. They were like, "Oh, Italian men, yeah, they'll give it all this." They're really, really, they think they're fucking macho, man. He said, but you just get out and, <laughs> and they soon shut up. And we went to a bar in the city centre and we were sat at a bar and we're drinking these bottles, drinking from bottles outside this bar. And the policeman, two policemen wandered up. You know, they're just going to like walk across us, right? And this yank just goes and he smashes the beer bottle on the pavement right in front of these two policemen and um and they just went and walked off i'm like dude do you always do that do you treat all policemen like that they're like Hey man, you don't worry about those guys. It's the Care Bears you gotta worry about. Like, what are you on about? What Care Bears? The Care Bears, man, the Carabinari. They're the real police in Italy. So in Italy, you've got these two police forces, a bit like it's gone in England now, except that, that the Carabinari are these tough, real hard, almost like a military-like police force that are geared up to, to going against the Mafia. Whereas the regular police officers, these kind of wimpy, wimpy folks that won't even say anything if you smash a beer, beer bottle at their feet. So we went back to the ship. Um, took these guys, you can see all that, the Harrier jump jets in this picture. Took these guys on board. In case you're wondering, no, security's not a problem. I mean, you can take guests on a military base or a uh, military ship anyway you just have to sign them in um, and of course these guys had their American ID cards which which was fine and so we're looking all around all, you know we're showing them all around the ship we're show, showing them where we work we're showing them our, our pistols obviously and then we went to dinner and this is quite funny so in in the in the um what they would call, do they call it the canteen or do they call it the galley, the same as us? Somebody can find that out. But they came into our galley and we're all queuing up at what, what you call in the military the hot plate and it was a roast. It was a Sunday, so we'd gone there on the Saturday. We were coming back on the Sunday and the chefs had laid on this delicious roast. The food's food in the armed forces is good. And... We, we're all going up getting our roast and the Americans came up, you know, after us and got theirs and we're all sat at this big, one big long table and this one of their guys sits down and he's got his tray with his plate on and he puts it down and everyone's sort of talking and then 
the British Marines just sort of look at his plate and he's got this food halfway to his mouth and he takes a he takes a bite and then tastes the food and then realizes we're all looking at him and he goes that's custard right <laughs> he thought he thought that the custard which was at the end of the hot plate waiting for the desserts to come out there was a big you know big metal bowl heated bowl full of custard and he thought that was the gravy he thought it was some kind of weird British gravy and he's like that's custard right <laughs> needless to say he ate, he ate it ate it anyway I've seen Marines eat a lot worse you don't want to know about that not on YouTube and yeah that was it it was a thoroughly uh, memorable experience that photo I've put it in the thumbnail just sums it up a lot of my photos got bits cut out because when I went through my kind of mega drug phase I thought it'd be a really clever idea to make a collage one day and um, so slowly the photos that I've really needed to make videos with I've had to find the negatives I've got I've probably got thousands of negatives from all around the world from for our younger watchers and listeners if you're wondering what a negative is it's in the old days you had your film when you had your film developed it's um i'm not even really sure is the negative the part of the film no it's not is it i don't even really know but the negative was what you were left with when you had the old cameras that you had to put films in and the negatives is what they give you in case you need any more prints done right and i've got thousands of thousands of these little um plastic cellulose see-through strips with that have got your pictures on right i've got thousands of them so yeah because i keep cutting them up or because i went through this phase of cutting them up i've now got to search through thousands of negatives to find the photos that i need and then take them downtown and get them reprinted but yeah that was the time the british royal marines met the u.s marines wonderful guys really great fun and uh just would have been brilliant to to spend so much more time with them anyway hope you enjoyed the dit that's marine speak for story Thank you so much for supporting the channel, everyone. If you could sub subscribe, if you if you haven't already, and chuck us a like. If you did like this, that is. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you next time, friends. Friend, thank you for watching my video. I'm the only person I know that has ticked every item off my bucket list. And I did so coming back from chronic addiction with no help from anybody. Now I want to pass those skills on to you, but I can't help you unless you help me and hit the subscribe button. So please do so and let's go and smash this world together.